Spotlight is proudly sponsored by HEC Media, St. Louis's home for arts, education, and culture. We have a ton of really amazing arts nonprofits in the St. Louis area. I really want people to be able to connect internally with themselves. If people can leave feeling more possible, I think that'll be a huge triumph. Today on Spotlight, a New York Times best-selling author visits St. Louis to talk about her comedic and clever thriller novels. Plus, find out why these endangered cows are wearing a Fitbit around their ankles. And then, the black experience through sound, moving image, and laser light animation. But first, helping the arts community by bringing back funding thanks to the Regional Arts Commission. It's Sunday and you're watching the multiple Emmy Award winning Spotlight. Hi, my name is Jay Scherter. I am the Communications Senior Manager at the Regional Arts Commission of St. Louis. The last two years have been really challenging for everyone and the Regional Arts Commission is included in that. The Regional Arts Commission of St. Louis gets 98% of its funding from the hotel and motel tax in St. Louis City and St. Louis County. So when you think about that, our revenue actually dropped by 60% during that time. We went from 16 employees all the way down to four. General operating support grantees, you know, we had to cut their funding by a drastic amount. Uh, we stopped doing the program support grants. We stopped doing the artist support grants. We simply just didn't have the funding to do all the things that we needed to do. So it was a really tough time. Fast forward to today. We are very optimistic about where we are at, but we still have a long ways to go. We're not seeing the same sort of hotel occupancies that we saw back in 2019. That being said, you know, we really have done everything that we can to help support the art and culture community here in St. Louis. Hey, I'm Katie Carpenter. I'm the executive director here at Perennial where we're filming today, right in the heart of our community workshop on South Broadway. So our mission here at Perennial is to build a creative culture of sustainability where discarded objects are transformed into cherished resources. Every year we divert over 10,000 pounds from the landfill. So as long as we can find the creative talent that is excited to share those skills. We love having classes and programs about those things. RAC has been offering perennial funding since 2013, and that started out as program support for our outreach programs. And we partner with at least five social service agencies a year, and we go out to those centers and teach DIY workshops using reclaimed materials on a monthly basis with each of those partners. That has been an awesome program and we've appreciated that support, but we were lucky enough in 2019 to be the recipient of operating support, which is amazing. As a nonprofit, that makes a huge difference to our capacity of how we're able to serve the St. Louis region that has been extremely beneficial and crucial, especially in these couple of tough years that we've been through with COVID. So in 2022, we were able to actually get program support grant and artist support grants back up and running. So we were very excited to be able to do that. Uh, we closed the applications in March and we had more than 300 organizations and artists apply for it. So it was very clear to us, the need was still very much out there. And for the fact that we were able to be able to provide funding again, people really jumped at that opportunity. We're gonna be making a very big grants announcement in June, and we're really going to, uh, to focus on some really great arts organizations in this community, as well as artists in this community who can really use that funding to not only better their situations, but better the lives of the people of St. Louis. The Regional Arts Commission of St. Louis has been working very diligently to make our grants process more efficient and friendlier to the everyday person. And what I also will say is, is we are dedicated to building our team back up to better serve the community. So we are slowly rebuilding our team, but making sure that the team that we're building are just full of special people, people that deeply care about the arts and culture sector in St. Louis. 12 million visitors come to St. Louis every year to experience the arts and culture sector. That's more than all of the sports in St. Louis combined. You know, we just are doing everything that we can to make sure to support our local arts community because we know when they thrive, the region thrives too.
this summer we're going to be doing the Gio Abada Fellowship Program, which Perennial is actually going to be taking a part of. So the Gio Abada Fellowship Program is all about attracting a more diverse and inclusive group of people into arts management. So how do you do that? Well, we start at the college level. We provide paid internships in partnership with the Gateway Foundation to be able to place actual students into all kinds of nonprofits across St. Louis. And we're also bringing back the Community Arts Training Institute, which took a bit of a break during the pandemic as well. What CAT does is brings together people in the community to be able to give them the training um, to bring the arts into their organization. These aren't arts organizations that are in this program. They're social workers. Um, you know, they're people that are working in government. It's people that perhaps don't think that art has a place where they work. We teach them art has a place in everywhere. We have a ton of really amazing arts nonprofits in the St. Louis area. If you're not familiar with them and what they do, you can come to our website at rackstl.org. We've got a full list of all these amazing organizations in our area and what they do. If you're just curious, if you're just wanting to, to, to really explore your creative side, and everyone does have a creative side, whether they claim they do or not, everyone has a creative side. We have so many great organizations in this area that really will help you uh, explore that. The Regional Arts Commission of St. Louis is scheduled to announce their 2022 grantees this week. Visit racstl.org for more info. HEC Media. Recognized. Celebrated. Honored time and again for excellence in the industry. Mid-America Emmys. Tellys. Natoas, Auroras, and other awards. HEC Media has been bringing home the hardware for over a decade. Hundreds of nominations and wins from regional to international levels. Arts and education to author talks, magazine shows and documentaries, individual craft achievements to overall excellence, plus so much more. And although doing good work is its own reward, recognition, well, it's nice too. See what all the fuss is about. Find all of the award-winning content at hcmedia.org. I had someone say to me that uh, my books are the funniest books about murder that they'd ever read. As entertaining as Sally Hepworth's novels are about crime and family dysfunctionality, Yes, of course. Of I mean, course. who wasn't feeling murderous during lockdown? Just wait until you see the New York Times bestselling author in front of a crowd. I always laugh when people say that writing a book is a get-rich-quick scheme. <laughs> no. We really shouldn't be surprised. After all, her social media presence highlighting her work, family members, and their shenanigans. Ooh, what book is this? That's a good one. You should give that one a try. Are hilariously real. I only want to kill them occasionally. Right. When I'm in lockdown with them. I right. like them a lot, generally. Speaking of, Sally discusses the new book she managed to write while locked down with her family in her Australian home for two straight years. The book is called The Younger Wife, but it is actually about a whole family. The book kicks off with the upheaval of Stephen announcing to his daughters that he's getting married again. And this is quite shocking both because the woman that he's marrying is 25 years younger and younger than both of his daughters, but also because he is uh, or still married to their mother who is in a nursing home with dementia. And like most Sally Hepworth novels, it doesn't take long for a crime to occur in The Younger Wife. There needs to be some death in chapter one and then... <laughs> <laughs> Sally talks about the personal events that influenced the book, including the story of her great Auntie Gwen's mysterious hot water bottle. It's like a rubber bag yeah, that you fill with hot water. And I always say little old ladies use it to warm up their feet in bed. I am one of those little old ladies. <laughs> and the homicide detectives she has on call to fact check her crimes. I can now text them at any time of day 
and say something like, how can I kill someone quickly without using any weapons? And they will just fire something back. And I, and I just have this at my um, disposal, which makes me very dangerous. Plus, despite all her success... But holy crap, it was not good. <laughs> why she still searches out her negative book reviews. I had one that said my books were like pizza, but Domino's pizza, so the type that, you know, you think is going to be a good idea at the time, but then afterwards you really regret it. <laughs> Look, the Younger Wife's here now, and there are a couple of personal influences that you had in writing this book. Yes, so there were three sort of seeds that came together to make this book. The first one was, unsurprisingly, Younger Wives that were showing up in my social circle with more regularity over the last couple of years. You know, we just accept that the woman has daddy issues and is a gold digger, but the man, what, he just, you know, is thinking with his pants? And I wanted to explore that. So that was the second thing. And the third thing, as this was all percolating, I received a phone call from my great auntie Gwen. She instructed me to go to her house and get her hot water bottle. I went into the house. I went into the spare room. I dug it up from under those newspapers and it was fat, you know, and I thought maybe it's the drugs. And I opened it up and it was full of cash. 50 plus thousand dollars and she explained to me that it was a combination of a bit of I can say this now because she's gone to that big nursing home in the sky uh, a little bit of pension fraud and a bit of a fear of banks all wrapped together that was the hot water bottle but at this point my writer's brain had gone and I knew that that was going to a hot water bottle full of cash was going to form the heart of the mystery that needs to be uh, solved in the book and that so I put those three things together and I had the trifecta. To find out about the movie Amy Poehler is making about one of her books, watch the full interview at hecmedia.org. Music therapy later on Spotlight. So these are Banting. They're a wild species of cattle from Southeast Asia. A lot of times people walk by and go, oh, it's a cow, but they're just as exotic as tigers and elephants. They live in Southeast Asia, in um, Indonesia, um, Cambodia, Vietnam. So we have uh, four Bantang here at the zoo. We have Oliver, the male. Uh, he's black in coloration with like white stockings and a white belly. So the males are usually a darker color and their horns are quite prominent and kind of meet in the middle on their forehead. And then we have three females. They're orange and kind of an orange brown color. Um, those are Hope. Uh, Flora and Bentley. They are endangered. Uh, there are around 8,000 in the wild. We've been studying Bantang here at the St. Louis Zoo since actually the early 90s. And we studied them because at that time no one knew anything about Bantang reproductive biology. And our job was to try and develop a technique for artificial insemination to produce offspring using frozen thawed semen. And we spent about a decade on it, and we actually had the world's first Bantang calf born here in 1997 from that technology. One of the things that we are looking into with Bantang is that because of their level of endangerment and the fact that there's now, um, for several decades now, have been an, an initiative to try and exchange genetics, between both zoos and the wild. Being able to have some re reproductive technologies that assist with that make it much easier than, for instance, moving a cow from Southeast Asia all the way to the United States or Europe and vice versa. The other thing we've been doing is using these um, anklets. They're like, they're fitness trackers and they're similar to what you'd have a like Fitbit-like that I think all of us have on our wrists nowadays. Instead, these go on the ankle of the cow um, and they can, just like the, your Fitbit, they can tell you how many steps you've taken, how often you're lying down. They tell you how much time you spend standing and a general index of activity. We've been collecting hormone samples from the Bantang for several years to look at patterns of reproduction and then correlating that with activity data collected by the fitness trackers. And we've been able to show that there are changes in activity um, around the time that a female would be most fertile and also right before she would deliver, so right prior to birth. And we also see changes in activity um, in the summer months when uh, hormone levels are highest, which is uh, suggesting to us that Bantang have a seasonal component to reproduction. That's something new that hasn't been described previously. These particular fitness trackers are on loan to us from University of Missouri-Columbia. 
the Department of Animal Science, and they've been using them on beef cattle to look at what happens around the time that the cows are gonna be giving birth. So unlike the Fitbit that I actually wear on my wrist, the Fitbit-like device for cows, this particular model of fitness tracker isn't wireless. So we do change them out about every two months. We're collecting activity data on the Banting 24 hours a day in 15 minute intervals. And then our samples are collected three times a week and that's been going on for quite a while. So then we're able to put those two data sets together to see how the patterns of activity um, correlate with uh, their hormone levels over time. I can tell you that we collected over 60,000 data points in a year's time from these cows. We are excited that we have had some pregnancies. Um, we believe that one of our cows is pregnant now we do have the ability to do ultrasounds. And so we have ultrasounded her and um, the hormones also look like she's pregnant. So fingers crossed, we'll have maybe some offspring soon. Blueprint for Summer St. Louis is the number one resource for St. Louis parents to find summer camps for their kids. So first, when you get to our search screen, you will see that there are so many different ways to search. There are over 30 different types of search criteria. So maybe you already know what type of camp your kid is interested in. Say they are interested in robotics and you are looking specifically for that camp, you can type in that keyword. And you'll also see a section for attributes. So maybe you just want your kid to be involved in a sports camp or an academic camp, one that's about dance, nature, STEM, cooking you'll see all those attributes. So most of those are about the type of summer camp that you'll look at. And then you'll get down to some of the other search criteria that may be more important to parents and families. Like, does it offer before and after care? Do they provide scholarships? Is it for students with special needs? Gifted students? Is it happening in the morning? Is it happening in the afternoon? So there are a lot of those search criteria that may be more around planning and effectiveness for parents and families. And then we also have search criteria for location. So you can say, I don't necessarily have a type of camp that I'm looking for, but I know it needs to be within three to five miles of my house or my job or grandma's house. Or maybe it's about cost and you can put in the cost that you need. And there are gender searches, um, date searches. And so you'll see all of this information that we know parents and families care about. Visit blueprint4.com to find the perfect camp for your child. Looking for videos to use in homeschool, classroom, or hybrid learning settings? Need them aligned to standards, lesson plans, or activity ideas? We've got them at educate.today. My name is Nicole Miller, I'm an artist. This work here I made specifically for this space and it started out with the production of the soundscape. So really the backbone of this installation is this 23 track um, surround sound, particularly because I'm working with young people, like it's been the sort of mission for me to try to find a way to position viewers to young people, specifically young people of color in America. This piece is a bit of an inverted film where the score is the sort of film and the moving image is more like the soundtrack. And so really the sort of narrative arc that's happening in the space is the soundscape. And so everything else that we worked on sort of radiated from uh, the sound work. We have a sound, a signal, and the circus. And so the sound is the 23 track sound installation and then a signal is this four laser um, animation installation that's projected on the back wall. And the circus sort of represents the three television screens in the space. Nicole Miller's installation, I Sound, A Signal, The Circus, explores um, synesthesia, so it looks at sort of different, um, different forms of expression and articulation, um, and how that sort of relates to the experience of being alive or what it feels like to have a body. This woman, Precious, who, she read out loud to me this incredible poem that very specifically was about the body and her experience of like having trauma happen to her body at a young age and um, it being translated through this sort of beautiful language she's developed as a poet. And that has become one of my favorite parts of the whole work at this point. Different conversations just happened and all of a sudden I was across from Nicole Miller and so she has some of my poetry as part of the installation. The phrase here and now is coming up and that phrase comes from Nicole Miller's 
meditation on what it means for like youth of color, particularly like black youth, to be brilliant in the here and now and to like value their contributions now versus what we can put into them to be these people in the future. I think this exercise of like withholding some things that I'm triggering people in the space to think about is really important. Um, like the bodies um, and also the circus. <laughs> that you have this idea of the circus in the space, um, but there is no circus in the space. Um, but you do have people that you can see rehearsing for different kinds of circuses. It's a kind of a space of becoming, like the rehearsal space. Um, and so all the people that you're seeing and hearing, I'm hoping um, that you're thinking about them in terms of like people that are ever changing and not sort of static in their identities. The idea or concept behind Kemper Live here and now is really thinking about how Nicole Miller describes the process of creative articulation as something of like a process of becoming. So um, looking at artists sort of in spaces of rehearsal and performance rather than the, the final product. And I think live arts especially are like a, are an important way to sort of capture that in, in the museum space. One, it, it activates the museum space um, and sort of challenges the idea of the museum as a static archive through these durational or sort of ephemeral experiences and in doing so I think challenges the sort of expectations of how one should behave in the space or in the presence of a work of art and Nicole Miller's project really does that too. You're really sort of um, a visitor is sort of implicated in, in, in the soundscape and, and sort of invited to sort of move around and be an active participant um, rather than a sort of passive spectator particularly with Miller's themes like about identity and transformation and body and youth-centered power, like all those themes converging. Like, what does that sound like? I, I don't know. And I think that's so cool. I love not knowing. If people can leave feeling more possible than they did coming in, I think that'll be a huge triumph. On display at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum through July 25th, Visit KemperArtMuseum.wustl.edu for more info. Scan the QR code on your screen to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. Each week at this location, a group of people come together to bathe. The mood is set, the lights are low, the candles are glowing, and the music is the soothing sound of singing. Now this is not your ordinary bath. Soap and water is not required, and the singers are not human. They are bowls, and this is a sound bath. Lisa Greslak is a licensed therapist and the founder of Savound, a meditative experience that bathes the listener in the healing properties of sound. We're here just to let go, calm down, surrender, and let the sound vibration take us to a place of groundedness and healing. I take them on this sound journey and I'm very, you know, deliberate about the bowls and okay, I want to get them in the head a little bit with some sounds and now I'm going to take them into the body. So I'm very clear about like the gong, obviously the gong or very low tones. And um, I mean, it just feels, that's why they call it a gong bath. It just feels like it's washing density out of your body. So when you start to listen to the sounds of crystal singing bowls or singing bowls, I'll just group them all together. They have a different kind of tone and sound than an instrument because they will keep singing, okay? No other instrument really sings on and on. So I can strike a bowl, I'm gonna strike one of the bigger ones, and it will just keep singing. And then when you start doing multiple bowls and start singing them, then these tones and these frequencies start to work with each other. And you might get like warbly sounds and whoa, whoa, whoa. And your mind starts to hook onto it. The brain is an electrochemical organ. 
There are four brainwave states that respond to frequencies. They are beta, alpha, theta, and delta. Beta, which is what we do. I'm going to work. I got to make coffee. I got to drop the kids off. I got to pay my bills. I got to, you know, get these things done before I leave work, whatever. That's beta, beta, beta. The beta brainwave state is a characteristic of a strongly engaged mind. Theta is when we are in a relaxed mode, and it's generally right before you go to sleep. That's the strongest point for sound as far as how it works with the mind. Theta states are the key to really important healing. When the mind's not engaged, the body is in a state of relaxation. Your autonomic nervous system is starting to settle down. Our cells repair when they're not stressed out, when they're not in dis-ease, when we're in a calm state. I am very, very dedicated to growth and development, and uh, I'm big on self-care and things that are, are good for my healing. And I have an incredibly stressful job, so that is a big part of my life. I also suffer naturally from uh, anxiety and depression. I have on and off. I've battled it for years since I was a teenager. But it just balances me out. Afterwards, I feel regulated. I feel balanced again, and I go home and I sleep every Thursday night, the best night of the week. It's it's incredible. Each note is medicine. Relax the left hip. And the right hip. It's more of a coping for me because it keeps me focused. It keeps me set on my path. And for someone that has done meditation, in my case before, never anything like this, but it does help me focus. It does keep me on the straight path um, as well as what I need to be doing and what should I be focused on, yes. I really want people to be able to connect internally with themselves, whatever that means for them. Feeling that joy, feeling that bliss about life. Um, you can be healed and you can make sense of maybe something that happened in the past, which has caused maybe you to hold on to the energy that's called, caused your illness or your dis-ease. But being connected with your authentic self, your deepest self, God, your higher self, your that's, to me, um, one of the elements that sound has an amazing um, ability to open up for us. Next week, inside the Strong Fathers, Strong Families initiative. Plus, a monument commemorating lawsuits brought before the St. Louis Circuit Court in the 1800s. Thanks for watching Spotlight. Join us next Sunday at 9.30 a.m. on KPLR 11.